Balzac and the Little Chinese Seamstress by Dai C. G. Part 1, Chapter 1, pages 3 through 10. The village headman, a man of about 50, sat cross-legged in the center of the room, close to the coals burning in a hearth that was hollowed out, out of the floor. He was inspecting my violin. Among the possessions brought to this mountain village by the two city youths, which was how they saw Luo and me, it was the sole item that exuded an air of foreignness, of civilization, and therefore aroused suspicion. One of the peasants came forward with an oil lamp to facilitate identification of the strange object. The headman held the violin upright and peered into the black interior of the body like an officious customs officer searching for drugs. I noticed three blood spots in his left eye, one large and two small, all the same shade of bright red. Raising the violin to eye level, he shook it, as though convinced something would drop out of the sound holes. His investigation was so enthusiastic I was afraid the strings would break. Just about everyone in the village had come to the house on stilts way up on the mountain to the witness the arise, arrival of city youths. Men, women, and children swarmed inside the cramped room, clung to the windows, jostled each other by the door. When nothing fell out of my violin, the headman held his nose over the sound holes and sniffed long and hard. Several bristly hairs protruding from the left nostril vibrated gently. Still no clues. He ran his calloused fingertips over one string, then another. Strange resonance froze the crowd, as if the sound had won some sort of respect. It's a toy, said the headman solemnly. This verdict left us speechless. Luo and I exchanged furtive, anxious glances. Things were not looking good. One peasant took the toy from the headman's hands, drummed with his fists on its back, then passed it to the, to the next man. For a while, my violin circulated through the crowd, and we, two frail, skinny, exhausted, and risible city youths, were ignored. We'd been tromping across the mountains all day, and our clothes, faces, and hair were streaked with mud. We looked like pathetic little reactionary soldiers from a propaganda film after their capture by a horde of communist farm workers. A stupid toy, a woman commented hoarsely. No, the village headman corrected her. A Burgess toy. I felt chilled to the bone despite the fire blazing in the center of the room. A toy from the city, the headman continued. Go on, burn it. His command galvanized the crowd. Everyone started talking at once, shouting and reaching out to grab the toy for the privilege of throwing it on the coals. Comrade, it's a musical instrument, Luo said as casually as he could. My friend here is a fine musician, truly. The headman called for the violin and looked it over once more. Then he held it out to me. Forgive me, comrade, I said, embarrassed, but I'm not that good. I saw Luo give me a surreptitious wink, puzzled. I took my violin and set it about tuning it. What you're about to hear, comrade, is a Mozart sonata, Luo announced as coolly as before. I was dumbfounded. Had he gone mad? All music by Mozart, or indeed by any other Western composer, had been banned years ago. In my sodden shoes, my feet turned to ice. I shivered as the cold tightened its grip on me. What's a sonata? the headman asked warily. I, I don't know, I faltered. It's Western. Is it a song? More or less. I replied evasively. At that instant, the glint of the vigilant communist reappeared in the headman's eyes, and his voice turned hostile. What's the name of this song of yours? 
Well, it's like a song, but actually it's a sonata. I'm asking you what it's called, he snapped, fixing me with his gaze. Again, I was alarmed by the three spots of blood in his left eye. Mozart, I muttered. Mozart? What? M Mozart is thinking of Chairman Mao, Luo broke in. The audacity. But it worked. As if he had heard something miraculous. The headman's menacing look softened. He crinkled up his eyes in a wide, beatific smile. Mozart thinks of Mao all the time, he said. I indeed, all the time, agreed Luo. Soon as I had tightened my bow, there was a burst of applause, but I was still nervous. However, as I ran my swollen fingers over the strings, Mozart's phrases came flooding back to me like so many faithful friends. The peasants' faces, so grim a moment before, softened under the influence of Mozart's limpic music like parched earth under a shower. And then, in the dancing light of the oil lamp, they blurred into one. I played for some time. Luo lit a cigarette and smoked quietly like a man. This was our first taste of re-education. Luo was 18 years old. I was 17. A few words about re-education. Towards the end of 1968, the great helmsman of China's revolution, Chairman Mao, launched a campaign that would leave the country profoundly altered. The universities were closed and all the, quote, young intellectuals, meaning boys and girls who had graduated from high school, were sent to the countryside to be, quote, re-educated by the poor peasants. Some years later, this unprecedented idea inspired another revolutionary leader in Asia, Cambodian this time, to undertake an even more ambitious and radical plan. He banished the entire population of the capital, old and young alike, quote, to the countryside. The real reason behind Mao Zedong's decision was unclear. Was it a ploy to get rid of the Red Guards who were slipping out of his grasp? Or was it the fantasy of a great revolutionary dreamer wishing to create a new generation? No one ever discovered his true motive. At the time, Luo and I often discussed it in secret like a pair of conspirators. We decided that it all came down to Mao's hatred of intellectuals. We were not the first to be used as guinea pigs in this grand human experiment, nor would we be the last. It was in early 1971 that we arrived at the village in a lost corner of the mountains and that I played the violin for the headman. Compared with others, we were not too badly off. Millions of young people had gone before us and millions would follow. But there was a certain irony about our situation. As neither Luo nor I were high school graduates, we had not enjoyed the privilege of studying at an institution for advanced education. When we were sent off to the mountains as young intellectuals, we had only had the statutory three years of lower middle school. It was hard to see how the two of us could possibly qualify as intellectuals, given that the knowledge we had acquired at the middle school was precisely nil. Between the ages of 12 and 14, we had been obliged to wait for the Cultural Revolution to calm down before the school reopened. And when we were finally able to enroll, we, will in, we were in for a bitter disappointment. Mathematics had been scrapped from the curriculum as had physics and chemistry. From then on, our lessons were restricted to the basics of industry and agriculture. Decorating the covers of our textbooks would be a picture of a worker with arms as thick as Sylvester Stallone's, wearing a cap and brandishing a huge hammer. Flanking him would be a peasant woman, or rather a communist in the guise of a peasant woman wearing a red headscarf 
according to the vulgar joke that circulated among us school kids, she had tied a sanitary towel around her head. For several years, it was these textbooks in Mao's little red book that constituted our only source of intellectual knowledge. All other books were forbidden. First, we were refused admission to high school. Then the role of young intellectuals was foisted on us on account of our parents being labeled, quote, enemies of the people. My parents were doctors. My father was a lung specialist and my mother a consultant in parasitic diseases. Both of them worked at the hospital in Chengdu, a city of four million inhabitants. Their crime was that they were, quote, stinking scientific authorities who enjoyed a modest reputation on a provincial scale. Chengdu, being the capital of Sichuan, a province with a population of 100 million, far away from Beijing, but very close to Tibet. Compared with my parents, Luo's father, a famous dentist whose name was known all over China, was a real celebrity. One day, this was before the Cultural Revolution, he mentioned to his students that he had fixed Mao Zedong's teeth as well as those of Madame Mao and Zhang Jiexi, who had been president of the Republic prior to the communist takeover. There were those who, having contemplated Mao's portrait every day for years, had indeed noted that his teeth looked remarkably stained, not to say yellow, but no one said so out loud. And yet, here was an eminent dentist stating publicly that the great helmsman of the revolution had been, had been fitted with new teeth just like that. It was beyond belief an unpardonable, insane crime, worse than revealing a secret of national security. His crime was all the more grave because he dared to mention the names of Mao and his consort in the same breath as that of the worst scum of the earth. Jang Jeshi. For many years, Lo's family lived in the apartment next to ours on the third and top floor of a brick building. He was the fifth son of his father and the only child of his mother. I'm not exaggerating when I say that Luo was the best friend I ever had. We grew up together. We shared all sorts of experiences, often tough ones. We very rarely quarreled. I will never forget the one time we came to blows, or rather the time he hit me. It was in the summer of 1968. He was about 15. I had just turned 14. That afternoon, a big political meeting was being held on the sports ground of the hospital where our parents worked. Both of us were aware that the butt of the rally would be Luo's father, that yet another public humiliation awaited him. When it was nearly five o'clock and no one had yet returned, Luo asked me to accompany him to the hospital. We'll note down everyone who denounces my father or beats him, he said. That way, we could take our revenge when we're older. The sports ground was a bobbing sea of dark heads. It was a very hot day. Loudspeakers blared. Luo's father was on his hands and knees in front of a grandstand. A great slab of cement hung around his neck from a wire so deeply embedded in the skin as to be invisible. Written on the slab were his name and his crime, reactionary. Even from where I was standing, 30 meters away, I could make out a dark stain on the ground made by the sweat dripping from his brow. A man's voice roared through the loudspeaker. Admit that you slept with the nurse. Lowe's father hung his head, so low that his face seemed buried in the cement slab. The microphone was shoved under his mouth and a faint, tremulous, yes, was heard. Tell us what happened. The inquisitor's voice barked from the loudspeaker. Who started it? I did. And then? A few seconds of silence ensued. 
Then the whole crowd screamed in unison, And then! This cry, raised by 2,000 voices, was like the rumble of thunder breaking over our heads. I started, Luo's father confessed. Go on, the details! But as soon as I touched her, I fell into mist and clouds. We left as the crowd of fanatics resumed their mass inquisition. On the way home, I suddenly felt tears running down my cheeks, and I realized how fond I was of the dentist. At that moment, without saying a word, Luo punched me. I was so taken aback that I nearly lost my balance.